Thank you guys so much for being here this afternoon. My name is Cindy Moss, and we're going to talk about putting the sizzle in STEM. If, if I stopped people on the street, if we were just walking down the street in Palm Springs or anywhere else and asked them what STEM is, 99% of them will tell me science, technology, engineering, and math. But then if I ask them what does that mean, it's very different. So what I'm going to do first is show you four pictures and it's a forced choice activity. You must choose one of the four that is the most STEM. So I'm gonna show you four pictures, pick which one is the most STEM, and then you're going to share with the person sitting closest to you why that one is the most STEM. These are middle school kids from a high poverty school district outside of uh, uh, Philadelphia. That's not a real baby, that's a, like a robotic baby that she's working on. Uh, it's kind of hard to see in this a little bit. This is a seining net. There's little fish and other things there at the shore. And these kids are in a classroom singing and dancing. And this young lady's in a classroom. And that device below the letter D, that's a 3D printer, if you didn't know what that is. So pick one. Don't say anything to anybody first. We're going to take 15 seconds and think. And then you're going to turn to the person next to you and tell them which is the most STEM and why. So just think. Ready? Go. Okay, we could spend a lot of time on this, but let's go back to A. If you chose A, stand up. If you chose picture A as the most STEM, stand up. Okay, thank you guys. When I do this in other places and we have time to like pass the mic around, what we hear is uh, that there's a robot there. That doll cost about $100,000. And so there's technology involved, and the kid has to be using things they know from science and math to figure out how to adjust to the baby. There's actually four people in, a, in another room that make the robotic doll react. And this is good because now when nurses and doctors are learning to do new techniques, they do it on this robot first before they do it on your baby that's sick in the middle of the night. If you chose B, stand up. Okay, good job. But many people choose this because the kids are getting their hands dirty, they're outside, they're touching things, they're collecting data, and it's, it's mostly the kids getting their hands dirty. And the last picture in this one, there's an adult, but the adult is the guide on the side. How many people chose C? Yay, sometimes people don't choose it. Thank you guys. These kids actually were singing a song about the solar system. And so they were singing and dancing to the content that they learned in the song, and it was in the classroom. And how many people chose D, the girl with the 3D printer? Okay, a lot of people choose that because you'd have to know some information to create whatever you're creating on the 3D printer. Actually, in reality, this girl was just walking by and the 3D printer was making some noise and she sat down just to watch it. That's the honest truth. But I think you guys get the picture. To me, these are all STEM. And when we talk STEM at Discovery, when I think of STEM for me as an educator, it's all of these. And we know, in my job now, I'm the Senior Director of Global STEM, and for four years I've been traveling the world, talking to school districts, companies, governments, anybody who'll listen to me about what kids and teachers need to do to do STEM. And so our definition of STEM is Students and Teachers Energizing Minds. That's our acronym, because we believe it's so much more than science, technology, engineering, and math. And when I go to schools, they'll say, oh, we do STEM. We have a STEM teacher, and the kids get to go see her once every two or three weeks. I'm like, no. I'll be like, we buy, we buy STEM kits. And I'm like, those look just like the FOSS kits we bought for lots of years. They just say STEM now instead of FOSS. Or they'll say, and you know what? If we're finished with reading and math on the first Friday of every month, we do STEM from one to two. And I laugh because I know that never happens. You're never finished, particularly in elementary school. So we believe this is a culture. It's about creating this culture where all kids in the school are given the opportunity to become creative problem solvers. My last superintendent, um, I was a teacher for 20 years and then 10 years at the district office, and my last superintendent um, said that the zip code of a kid should not determine the quality of their education. In, in North Carolina, every county is a district, so we had 145,000 kids in 189 buildings, 27 different zip codes. And so when we talk about STEM at Discovery, we believe it's STEM for all. We've been talking about STEM as a country for a long time. This, this diagram is from 2008. And I've had STEM in my title for 12 years. But we talk about it a lot, and particularly in California, you guys are the state with the most STEM jobs of any state in the country. I hear your politicians talking about it all the time. But when I visit classrooms, I don't know that I see that the change has really made it to where you guys are. But in 2008, they put this diagram together. These are real numbers. In 2001, there were 4 million ninth graders. In 2005, 2.8 million graduated. 
we don't talk about those kids who don't graduate, and that already really bothers me because I don't know where they're going or what they're doing. Of the 2.8 million who graduated, 1.9 million got into some kind of college, community college, four-year college. Of the 1.9 million who got in, 1.3 million were able to stay after one semester. That's another thing we don't talk about, the revolving door in college where kids go in, get debt, flunk out of school, and go home with nothing but debt. Of the 1.3 million who stayed in college for a second semester, they predicted 166,000 would get STEM careers or STEM majors. It was less than 120,000. And you guys heard, if you heard the keynote this morning, there's all kinds of data out there. And if you look at other data, while we're sitting here, every 18 seconds, somewhere in the US, a kid drops out of high school. I'm 56, I'd like to retire at some point. I want them to have skills to be able to get a job and, and support themselves. When you can find them, 84% of them say they dropped out because they couldn't pass Algebra 1. And you guys know the way we're ramping up math across the country. We have to figure this out. And the National Council for the Teachers of Math said if a district has problems with Algebra 1, and they say that every district in the country has a problem with Algebra 1 if every kid is not mastering it, algebra, but if you have that problem, they say you have to go all the way back to pre-K and kindergarten and figure out how do we teach those kids to count. We are, you guys, I'm sure, know this, but we're the only country in the world where it's socially acceptable to say I don't do math. And we have to change that. The U.S. Army did a study called Ready, Willing, and Unable to Serve. They brought in 1,000 kids from uh, Pennsylvania that were 18 to 28 years old. So these are kids who graduated high school, and they spent a day with them. They gave them physical fitness tests, reading tests, math tests, and problem-solving tests. And what they found, 70% of these kids would not qualify to go into the military at the lowest level because of their lack of problem-solving skills. So the U.S. Army has declared the lack of STEM skills a matter of national security. Other numbers, in 2015, 1% of the kids who graduated from college got a degree in science. If you got a degree in science or science education, stand up. All right, good job. We are some of that 1%. So there's not that many people that will do that. And if you look at other countries, it's much higher. Math is so much worse. 0.01% of the people who graduated in college got a math degree. If you have a math degree or math education degree or statistics degree, stand up. Good job. You guys are highly sought after because 0.01%. I live in Charlotte, where the second largest banking capital in the country after New York City. And but several of my friends work in HR for Bank of America, Wells Fargo, different banks. The banks in this country hire 90% of the math majors. And they would like three times as many if they could find them. But I think we have to let kids know the cool kinds of things you get to do in a bank if you major in math. And I'll get to that in just a minute. I can investigate the mysteries of the human body from the inside out. I can do experiments and learn to think like a scientist. I can learn biology while I'm still learning English. I can solve problems that I couldn't understand before. I can engage. I can build. I can achieve. I can learn. 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 Um, just to tell you a little bit about why I'm up here talking to you guys, I, I taught high school biology, chemistry, anatomy for 20 years, 15 years in Syracuse, New York, five in Charlotte. And uh, then uh, I won something called the Milken National Educator Award. You may have had somebody at your school who won it. The Milkens are from Santa Monica, California. They're the fifth and eighth, eighth richest guys in America. And every year they give away $3 million of their own money to teachers and principals because they believe in America we don't value our educators enough. And so this is when I won. You don't know. You don't apply. Your superintendent nominates you. It's a total surprise. They show up and give you a check for $25,000. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, besides being a teacher and a coach, my husband and I owned a McDonald's for 10 years when we lived in Syracuse. And so I wrote our business plan. I went to Hamburger University. And if I didn't have a cross-country meet or basketball game, the students would come through the drive through on the weekend to see Mrs. McMoss serving French fries because they thought it was, it was funny to see their science teacher serving French fries. But the biggest thing I learned from McDonald's that impacted me as an educator, because running a McDonald's is like being a high school teacher. Your employees are all 16 and 17. But what I learned is the first six months that we hired somebody, it didn't matter if they're making french fries, cleaning the bathroom, stocking the shelves, whatever they were doing. We spent more money training them than we spent paying them in the first six months. And that just really hit me as a teacher. 
Think about like you get a day of PD before school starts and then you usually get one in January or February. And yet to make french fries and hamburgers, we were spending more money training them than paying them in the first six months. So 25 years ago, I made up my mind if I were ever in charge of teachers, I was going to do whatever it took to get my teachers the PD they deserved because as important as quality french fries are to McDonald's, we're making kids futures. I also consider myself a steminist and you guys can be steminists too. Yeah, guys, you can be stimulus just as much as the females. All that means is that you believe that women should be, able, should be able to go in the STEM pipeline. If you listen to some of the statistics this morning, or if you know some of the statistics, women, we make up about 50% of the workforce, depending on whose numbers you look at. But in STEM fields in general, we're about 20%. And if you look in IT, sometimes we're less than 10%. So if we could double the number of females in these STEM fields, we go a long way in filling the, the leaky STEM pipeline. And I think we can do it. We have to do it at K-12, pre-K-12. If you think about it, as females, we're born wanting to make the world a better place. That's why we go into education. That's why we go into health care. And so girls, like seven, eight-year-old girls, they already want to make the world a better place. So in education, it's our moral obligation to show these girls that if you have STEM skills, you really can make the world a better place. And we need to tell them the truth. In 2016, I, I travel the world. There's nowhere you want to live other than the U.S., but in 2016, women, we still make 77 cents on the dollar compared to a guy with the same education and experience level and the same job. Now, not in education because nobody really gets paid what they're, they're, they deserve. And the only place that's different is in STEM. In STEM, women make 98 cents on the dollar and companies are actively recruiting females. So I think we just need to tell them the truth. This is where I live in Charlotte. You guys may ne never have been through Charlotte. Uh, if you've, you, we are the big hub for US Air on the East Coast now. It's American. Uh, but we have about a million people, kids from about 120 different countries, 145,000 kids in 189 buildings, 10,000 teachers. We're in a place with no unions. It's a right to work state. And so when, after I won the $25,000, I used it to finish my PhD out of Australia. And then first I took over science for the district. And one of the things that you have to know when you are in a large urban district is about every one and a half to two years, you get a new superintendent. So you can't count on the superintendent being the leader. And anything you're doing, you can't count on it staying in place unless you get some, some local support. So I immediately went to the businesses because I knew the businesses would care about STEM. Charlotte would like to be known as the energy capital of the country. And we have three companies, the Duke Energy, Areva, and Shaw, three really big energy companies. And so I went to them. I'm like, you guys are energy companies. You have really good paying jobs. Lots of people would like to work for you. We're in pre-K-12 trying to prepare kids for the future. What do you need? And they said, in the next 10 years, we're going to need another 50,000 employees. I'm like, wow. And the average starting salary is like 75,000. I'm like, that's really cool. You need 50,000 new employees. Do you need... 45,000 that have four-year engineering degrees, and they laughed at me. They're like, no, maybe 1,000 with four-year engineering degrees. But we would love 30,000 people with a two-year mechatronics degree. You guys, anybody heard of mechatronics? Okay, if, mechatronics is a combination of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and IT. If you have a kid at home, a biological kid, or a kid in your class who likes to play video games and take things apart, this is a really good career for them to go in. On, on the, in the southeast, where salaries are much lower than where you guys live, uh, this two-year degree starts somewhere between seventy-five dollars and $80,000, and there's a waiting list of companies to employ them. I also went, we had 22 hospitals, and I taught biology and anatomy. I had lots of kids who wanted to go to medical school, nursing school, be physical therapists, but I went to the hospitals and said, what do you guys need? And do you have any jobs that take less than two years? Because many of my struggling kids weren't going to go to four years of college, then graduate school. And they said, sure, there's all kinds of great ways to go into healthcare. The first one they showed me was to be a surge tech. A surge tech takes 10 months and it costs $10,000. In Charlotte, if you're African American or Hispanic and you had a B average in high school, you go free. What you do as a surge tech, you take a cafeteria tray like, or a McDonald's tray, it looks like that, you go to the supply closet and you get the tools the surgeon needs to do, open heart surgery, knee surgery, whatever they're doing. You watch surgery, when it's over, you sign something they didn't leave anything inside the body, because that'd be bad, and then you put it in the dishwasher. So $10,000. And you start at 55,000. And our, our teachers in North Carolina start at 35,000. And once you get in the surge tech job, the hospital will pay for you to go through any other schooling that they have. So you don't need to go into debt. A radiation technician is a two year program, costs $20,000. You start at about 90,000. This is the person who runs mammograms, anything that has to do with radiation, radiation therapy. And I tell people if I were going back to school right now, this is what I would do. 
extracorporeal technology is a two-year program. They don't take you if you're under 30 because in this job, if you make a mistake, somebody dies. But it's two years, costs $20,000. And if, if somebody's having open heart surgery, you're running the machine that's keeping their blood healthy the 10, 12 hours they're doing surgery. If you make a mistake, somebody dies, so it's pretty high stress. But by federal law, you can only work 12 hours a week. So most people work two six-hour days, and you start at $150,000 a year. Yeah. <laughs> I used to take my teachers in Charlotte to go see all of this, and I had to stop for the very same reaction that you guys just had. <laughs> so especially my math and science teachers, they could do the math. Um, I went to NASCAR. We have about 100,000 people in Charlotte who work in NASCAR. Average starting salary is about 75,000. They want two semesters of community college, math and science, and a portfolio that shows that you can solve problems. Um, I told you about the banks. One of my friends in, at home in Charlotte, I play French horn. We play French horn together. He works at Bank of America. He has an undergrad degree in statistics. He's on a team of 200 people, and their full-time job is pro sports. They get paid to go to pro football, pro basketball. He went to the Super Bowl. He gets to go, he's going to the Olympics. He gets to go to all kinds of amazing things. And he and his team make algorithms that tell the bank how much to invest in sports. Their starting salary is around 150000 and last year his bonus was 200000 so we, I know we have kids in school who are good at math, but they think, what good does it do me to be good in math? And I, I coached for 20 years. I love sports. So if you have that kid who wants to be a pro football player, basketball player, tennis star, whatever it is, that's a good goal. Their backup plan should be to major in math or statistics, and then they could go to work for one of the sports broadcasting companies. They could go to work for a bank. They could go to work in all kinds of things doing the numbers of sports. I have another nephew, or I have a nephew who wanted to major in gaming and producing his own games, and his parents wouldn't let him. They're like, go get a business degree, something that can make some money. And he graduated, couldn't find a job. Finally, after about a year and a half, got a job as an assistant manager at um, a GameStop store selling games. He met somebody from EA Sports, and now he has his, his dream job. What he does is, this is uh, one of the holes from Augusta, from the Masters, but he travels the world, and they take about 1,500 to 2,000 pictures of every hole. They shoot about 2,000 shots. They study the scores of all the pros who played it, and they put it together so when you play this game, when you hit the ball, it's, you're within one centimeter of accuracy of what would really happen. And his starting salary was 100,000. Last year, his bonus was 50,000. <coughs> also, our kids all have, they all have a Spotify account. They have an iTunes account, some kind of digital music account. There's a lot of people working in the data and the statistics behind that. So we just need to show the kids, you like music and you're good at math, you could spend your whole life studying the music with your math. We also need to talk to them about apps. Think about how many apps you have on your phone, your iPad, your Surface, whatever you have. And the, the app economy just continues to grow. And we have kids right now um, that can create their own apps and make some money. Um, my church at home adopted a high poverty school nine years ago. The superintendent said, Charlotte, you're the buckle of the Bible belt. I need the churches to get involved. So we adopted this high poverty school. This year it's 99% free and reduced lunch, 17% homeless. And every rising sixth grader, they go to camp for three weeks and we give them a raspberry pie. This little girl's working on a raspberry pie. Last year we had a kid, Joe Kwan, African-American kid. The, the goal is that they should be able to create their own game within three weeks. He had a game created at the end of the first day. And the, game, the guy who was a game designer said, I've never seen anybody be this good at this. And so we started talking to Joe Kwan, checked his, his uh, numbers from fifth grade, and he was in the top 1% in the state in reading math and science. Now this was a poor kid. It was kind of a surprise that he, was, that he did that well. So the next day of camp I said, Joe Kwan, a lot of sixth graders struggle when they go from fifth grade to sixth grade and they struggle with math. So why don't you make an app to help sixth graders do math? Because who better to help a sixth grader do math than a sixth grader who does math well? He goes, well, that's a good idea. He goes, I can make some money from that? I'm like, yeah, you could. So he worked for a couple weeks, sold a 99 cent app, and this kid whose mom was working two, two full-time minimum wage jobs to keep food on the table for her three kids and three nieces and nephews she's raising, he's gonna make a quarter million dollars this year on his app. If you are somebody who's a leader in your school or school district about STEM, one of the things you need to do is go to stemconnector.org. It's a national organization, about 10,000 companies, nonprofits. And if you sign up, you'll get something called the STEM Daily. And it's about, it'll, there'll be STEM competitions, there'll be STEM grants that are out there, STEM jobs that are coming up. And if, you're, if your superintendent writes or calls, they will print out the data for your school to show you where are the jobs within three or four counties of where you live. 
I call this stuff, this was my STEM munition. It's what I used to go to my school board to get money to do the things we needed to do in STEM because I could show them that we needed to be teaching kids so they were developing the skills to take the jobs in our community. And if you ask most of your parents or guidance counselors at your school uh, what are STEM jobs, most of the time they'll say engineering, architecture, being a doctor. But if you look at the data from the Department of Labor, 71% of the jobs in the next 10 years are going to be heavily in computing. Another organization you might want to check out is um, changetheequation.org. And Change the Equation says currently 50% of our jobs are 50% STEM, but within 10 years, 75% of all jobs are going to be 75% STEM. So, so I taught for 20 years, I won that award, took over uh, science for the district, and so I decided I've been a high school teacher, I need to go check out what's going on everywhere else. And so I went to pre-K. We had about 6,000 kids in pre-K, lots of money. I knew I didn't have much money in terms of science, so I looked at my district, where did the money go? And pre-K and Title I had all the money, so I'm like, I have to make friends with them so I can get some of that money. And when I looked at pre-K, think about how many times a three or four year old says why. They were born to do STEM. Their brain is trying to figure things out. They're looking for patterns. And so we just had to figure out how to help their teachers understand how to do this. And so now in Charlotte, the pre-K day is 50% STEM. If I could get everything to look like that, we'd be happy. These little girls were in first grade. They didn't know that they weren't supposed to like math. They didn't know they hadn't had um, geometry. They just said, we need another triangle. Who's got a glue stick? And these little boys were in second grade. They didn't say, I haven't had calculus or physics. They're like, send us a stopwatch. We're ready to test. So early on, it made me just it reinforced the idea that the kids aren't afraid of STEM. It's the adults that we have to help figure out. And when I was telling you guys about the jobs and you could see the good money that you could make and that you didn't have to kill yourself in terms of number of hours, well, why does this matter to your kids or to your students? This is from Marion Wright Edelman, the lady from the, that started the Children's Defense Fund. You can't be what you can't see. I really feel like STEM in our schools is a matter of social justice. And it is our moral imperative to make sure that all of our kids understand that people who look like them can have these skills and can solve problems to make the world a better place. But when I talk to parents, this is what I'll show them Oops. about why they need to do STEM. So tell me, why should we hire you? I have two kitty cats. One, two, because I got stuff I can do. I like playing in my treehouse. I like ponies and lip gloss. I do a pretty good job. I can't really talk about it. My mommy got married to my dad before I was born. Yeah, because my middle name is Rose. Mom, English. Would you like some lip gloss? I have some in my purse. I have a wrap of my tights. <laughs> I live right here. I can be your security. I'm kind of a star being in love. Oh, uh, yeah! I don't have anything else. I like chipmunks. Oh, I have one more. What are the hours? I have a tight schedule. Tomorrow's jobs are in science, technology, engineering, and math. Good thing you have a few more years to get them prepared. I think I'm done. And I show you that because we can all use a good laugh after lunch, but at home, the kid who lives to the left of me graduated from Duke University in 2013. And I'm, I'm a Tar Heel, we hate the Dukies, but I will say Duke is a good school. This kid graduated in 2013 with $105,000 in debt. The kid to the right of me went to Davidson, another really good school, graduated in 2013 with $107,000 in debt. They both are living at home, one works at the grocery store and one works at Starbucks. And they are pissed off. They're mad. They were in the top 1% of their high school class. They were in the top 5% of their college class, and yet they don't have skills to get a job. The community college in Charlotte has 70,000 students, more than any institution of higher learning in North or South Carolina. They surveyed their students in the fall, and 84% of them already had a four-year degree or a master's degree going to community college to get skills that will get them a job. It's time for us to tell kids and parents the truth. Okay, that it's, and college, the, the universities, they're, you know, they're doing a good job, but the companies are saying they would rather hire someone with a two-year degree and skills and, and evidence that they can do something than somebody with a four-year degree and a lot of theoretical knowledge. But before these kids can be STEM people and STEM learners, teachers have to be STEM teachers. And we teach the way we were taught. None of us were taught this way. So we know that we need some professional development. After I won that National Teaching Award, I got to be on a federal commission, and we looked at data about what was happening around the country with STEM. 
The National Science Foundation spent a billion dollars with a B over 10 years doing something called the Urban Systemic Initiative. In large school districts all over the country, they worked with teachers. They, these were middle and high school science and math teachers. They were trying to get them to use more technology and more hands-on. And what they found is if you want to change a teacher's practice, we need 80 hours of PD over two years' time. And remember, we get that day in the fall and a day in January. But we need 80 hours of PD to change our practice. And if you want to change the culture, we need 160 hours over three years' time. And I think back to the McDonald's kids. We didn't ask the girl making French fries to come learn how to make French fries before she was getting paid or stay when she was done. We trained her and coached her while she was there. That's what we've got to do for teachers. So we also, um, when I was in Charlotte and now with Discovery, we decided we needed to put some parameters around STEM because p when you just leave it so open, it's, it's, it's scary. It's frightening for educators. So one of the cool things about STEM is you never have enough time to do what you need to do. If you have snow days or bad weather days, you're always losing time. They pull the kids out to check their eyes, whatever they do. And so in STEM, when you're solving a real world problem that kids care about, you can teach content from math and reading and social studies and science and use the arts. We know we need to use hands-on inquiry because the brain research says when you touch things, you use up to 60% of your brain. We know we need connections to the real world. I tell people all the time that kids have really good fake meters. They know if we're giving them a real problem or just something from page 77 on the end of chapter three. And we need to, we need to honor their thinking and give them real problems. Um, I get to be the MC at the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And in the US, there's about 120 people still alive in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And they surveyed them. 82% of them had their idea before they were 10, before the world told them what was possible. But over 90% of them didn't get to produce it until they were 60 or older. So we need to engage young kids before the world's told them what's not possible. Oh, and whether an, a company is hiring somebody who's 18 and has a high school diploma or they have a PhD, the employers tell us that they need critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity, that those 21st century skills are the most important attributes that a new employee or any employee can have. We also know that real learning, and for these kids who have these great fake meters, needs to be transdisciplinary. If you're building a bridge, you don't say, from 9 to 10 I'm doing literacy, and 10 to 11 I'm doing math, and 11 to 12 I'm doing science. Use everything you know to solve the problem, and whatever you don't know, use your research skills to figure it out. And that's what we're trying to do with transdisciplinary. We also know that one of the, the best parts of, of giving kids STEM teaching and learning is they develop, they develop their persistence. And you guys have heard all the stories, the kids that are in college, that their parents are calling the professors because they didn't make an A, and that, you know, this whole generation of kids who everybody gets a trophy. In STEM, kids learn that when you're, when you're designing something new, if you're an innovator or an inventor, rarely do you do it right the first time or the tenth time. It can be tens of thousands of times. And when kids read these real stories, it helps them understand that's the way the world works. If you're using Discovery, and many of you guys have Discovery in some form, STEM is everywhere. But it's just a matter of helping your teachers, your kids, and your parents understand what they're seeing that's there. And I knew, even though science and math were the things that I cared about the most and that STEM skills is what mattered to the employers, in school, no matter what you do, those reading scores are always going to be important. In North Carolina, they publish the name of the school and the teacher, and they put your scores in the paper. So people get to see how your kids do. So we knew we needed to get kids to read. My mother-in-law has her PhD in reading, so when I was a high school biology teacher, when I was working on my dissertation, my research showed my kids had to learn 15 new words every 20 minutes just to pass our state test. Biology is the most vocabulary-laden course that they'll take. And so my mother-in-law helped me come up with this, and we put these posters up in all the science classrooms, reading like a scientist. Because when you're reading in a science textbook, 50% of the information is in the pictures, the diagrams, and the charts. And so you have to help your kids see it. And I had some of the most struggling kids. I also had the AB, AP, IB kids who were the most gifted. And they said, why didn't somebody teach me this in third grade? So we created these posters that we ended up putting in the elementary schools. These are the kinds of things you need to do if you're reading for STEM in, in an elementary classroom. And then ultimately we had reading like a mathematician, reading like an artist, reading like a historian. We ended up having them for every discipline. This is something from Discovery called a skill builder. It's a diagram of like the groundwater cycle. And you click on it and you get a paragraph. And because it's digital, we could track the kids. Most kids were going through this four or five times. Do you think if we gave them 10 pages to read, they'd go back and read it four or five times? I don't think so. But because it was te technology-based, they did. 
All right, we're gonna stop, well, actually, let me skip over this. We also knew we needed to give kids problems to solve, and because of all the stress that you get from all the state testing, a lot of us have just gotten, gotten into how fast we can teach something. Uh, the last department, when I was in the biology department at my last high school, there were 10 of us teaching biology, and one teacher would always raise her hand and say, I can teach objective 3.1.1 in seven minutes. You guys know how we, we get so under the gun, but we need to give kids problems to solve and make them figure it out. And I wanna show you, this is an example. So I'm gonna ask you, once you see this, to tell me how you would solve it. Okay, here's one you can do at home. Take some smoothed out candy wrapper foil and wrap it around a thick pin. Close off one end and slip in a marble so it's free enough to move around inside. And there we have a tube. Okay, and now we're going to put our tube at the top of an inclined length of wood and let it go. Will it backflip end over end, slide down marble in first, or defy gravity and stay right where it is at the... Okay, so I want you to turn to the person next to you. Is it going... If you were in my class, we'd stop and we'd do this, but we don't have time to do it right now. So turn to the person next to you. Is it going to flip, slide, or stay, and why? Okay, watch and see what it's going to do. Now watch, it's going to show you why. So what I would do if you were my students, now that you've seen this, and we would have done it, now I would give you five vocabulary words, four pages to read, tell you to work with the four people at your table, and come up with a 20-second script that explains what you just saw. So think about now why I've given you a reason to read deeply and you want to figure it out. And that, that's part of the power of what we're doing in STEM. And we need to get kids working together. They need those 21st century skills. Uh, I told you about in my biology class, I needed to learn 15 new words every 20 minutes. I developed this activity, this word card activity. They would come in every day, we had 90 minute classes. In the first 10 minutes, they would get these word cards that had phrases and concepts that we'd studied and they'd be with a different person and I'd ask them questions to put the phrases together and talk about how they fit together. Uh, we also want kids, as they're reading, to develop things together. And this is from a high school chemistry class. Uh, the teacher gave them the song. In Discovery, there's 20,000 songs, all kinds of content, K-12. She, she gave them the, the lyrics to the song. They had a couple pages to read. They had to draw a picture that illustrated their song. And then they put it together in a one-take paper slide video. So let me show you what that looks like. I am matter with shape and volume. Call me solid cause my particles are fixed and arranged More amorphous cause my melting point depends on my pattern I do the rubber plastic butter change Should I be melting from a solid to a liquid Taking energy my particles they move real fast Or should I freeze so particles can chill and move slowly Here's an ice covered photograph Someday I hope to sublimate Move from a solid to gas Without the liquid state And that way I'll never evaporate Cause I'm already a fluid Without a volume or shape With particles so hard to contain So think about, instead of lecturing to the kids, the teacher let the kids read and discover their own meaning and illustrate it. Same, this is another example, and I use high school examples because most people know elementary kids will do this. High school kids are just little kids in big bodies. They like to do it too. Ice is a solid that cools my drink. It has a melting point like most things it melts. At 32 or half a higher degrees If solids now a fluid liquid Yeah, the state has changed If energy is entering The particle speed up and bring a solid to a liquid Then a liquid to a gas But if the energy is exuding The particles slow naturally From gases to liquids Then liquids to solids Come on The states of matter cycle all around 
We also know we need to give kids experiences. Um, every year, in my church takes a group of kids, about 50 kids, over spring break to South Carolina to do Habitat for Humanity houses because in North Carolina, you have to be 18 to work on a construction site. In South Carolina, you only have to be 14. So we take them down there. And when we're doing framing, every 10 or 15 minutes, some kid comes up to me and they're like, Cindy, this is so cool. This is physics. This is geometry. This is algebra. I'm like, uh-huh, it is. And I know you can't take every kid to build a house. And so discovery, the, the beauty of technology is there's all kinds of ways to bring these experiences to kids. Discovery's created something called virtual labs. This one is a middle school engineering lab. The kids select the ground type, the foundation, what they make the house out of. They build this house, and then they put it in an earthquake. And it's middle school, so of course the boys try to blow it as blow it apart as fast as they, they can. But for the teacher, we give them a rubric. We tell them how to do this. We give them videos. This is Danny Forster, our chief engineering and architecture expert who can talk to kids about how using math and science allows them to be a good architect. Uh, we also know that like, the National Science Foundation says one experience where a kid gets to be someone who's in STEM and believe they can do it can make all the difference in the world. And so we have something we call STEMtastic Saturdays. And we come in and work with the teachers. You choose. We have 15 different activities. You choose which ones you're going to do. We train the teachers to run them. The kids get to do a type of project like they would do in, in that profession. They get to see how do you get there, what kind of education and training do you, does it take. And they last about six hours on Saturday. Many schools, the PTA is paying for them or they find a local company to pay for it. Here's an example of what this looks like. Today it was a really fun experience, even though it was one day, it was a really fun experience being with all these Discovery people. It's really cool learning about technology. Quiet on the set. I had the most fun doing the game controller. I made a game pad out of Play-Doh and wires. We got the Play-Doh, we set it on a piece of paper, then we attached wires to them and put them onto a circuit that we plugged into the computer, and um, we used them to play Pac-Man. It was pretty amazing, because I didn't even know that that's possible to use Play-Doh as a game pad. That is just mind-boggling. I was surprised that I could make a video game out of Play-Doh because I never knew that was even possible. Come on, everybody hold hands! Well, everyone held hands with a tube and it would light up. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Give Harrison and Sophie a round of applause. And on three. One, two, three. <laughs> and I'm thinking you didn't follow directions. <laughs> she had a little filter, yeah, so she cheated. We learned about engineering. I had the most fun building a bridge. Great job, nice bridge. Well, my bridge held eight ounces. It has to cross the river. There we go. It barely held three ounces. <laughs> London Bridge is falling down. We built all the supports on the top and it didn't really work that way. But the supports more on the bottom. We had the most fun building a bridge and seeing if it could hold up weights. 36 ounces. Those are two ounces each. Here's one ounce. 37. Ours held the most weight, so it's pretty much our bridge one. <laughs> yeah. We have three good artists in this room. <laughs> Today was awesome, and I just have a, had a great experience. It was a really fun experience for me. Today was awesome. We also know we need to connect families because it's not just about your kids finding out jobs that they can get in the future. You'll find many of your families are underemployed and unemployed as well. So the STEM, we do a STEM family night and the same thing, we'll come in and work with the teachers to choose the activities, show them the kinds of jobs that are there. We hold their hand the first time, reflect after it's over and then they can do it on their own 
after the first time. You may want to take a picture of this or write this down. This is a Discovery Education website that has everything free for STEM. And having been in education for 30 years, I know how important free is. Um, one of the things when I came into Discovery Ed is I wanted us to have some STEM camp. When I was in charge of my school district in Charlotte, I was buying STEM camp in the summer and paying about $10,000 for a week of curriculum. So we have curriculum on here for you absolutely free. It's written for kids who finish fourth through eighth grade, so we've used it in upper elementary, middle school, and rising ninth graders. But you can go on right now and download it. There's 50 hours of content on water, 50 on urban infrastructure, and 50 on energy. And the goal is by summer of 2017, we're going to add cybersecurity, uh, food, and reverse engineering the brain. So we're working on problems that we think we need to solve. And you just go download them. Um, also, when you go to that web page, there's other competitions. The Young Scientist Challenge I'm going to talk to you about in just a little bit, fifth through eighth grade. These other things fit for the classroom. This is the STEM of staying healthy. It's for K-5. Science of Everyday Life is K-8. Semen Science Day is K-8. From the ground up is middle school soil science. Navy STEM for the classroom is high school. And the last two are high school, looking at different jobs and innovation related to STEM. Also, discovery about the company Lumosity, you know, the brain training thing that you'll see on TV sometimes. And as a teacher, you can go in through this website and set up, um, set up accounts for your students so when they're finished, instead of wasting time, they're training their brain. Uh, the 3M Young Scientist Challenge, the little boy on the left who's actually from California, somewhere near LA, and his, his idea, all, all they have to do is make a video, a one to two minute video of their idea for an invention. They don't have to know how to make it, just an idea. And there's a winner from each state. The top 10 then, uh, then are chosen, and they get to work with a mentor from 3M, a person, an engineer or scientist who has at least 100 patents. And it's the, right now the contest is open. They have to be turned in by, by the middle of April. So if you just Google 3M Young Scientist Challenge, you can find it or go through that discovery site. And then they, they work with these scientists. They come together in October, and the winning kid gets $25,000. The little boy on the left, he created a way to tell if you had been hit hard enough playing football that you might have a concussion. Uh, they get to work with the 3M scientists. They have a competition. The top four go on a trip. I got to go to Costa Rica with the kids to study STEM that was happening in Costa Rica. And this is a video of one of our winners. This, this kid is from uh, Florida. And he actually won as a fifth grader. Come on. Our next guest is an inventor who just was named America's top young scientist for 2013 from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Please welcome 12-year-old Peyton Robertson. <laughs> Really good. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. You're a very impressive young man, 12 years old, and you've invented a few things and won an award. Very impressive. <laughs> yes, ma'am. A lot of a lot of kids think of ideas, but yours actually turn out to work. So, um, <laughs> how old were you when you invented your first thing? Well, you know, I was eight. I was in third grade. I've always loved math and science and learning about how things work and making things work better. Right. You know, my parents have always told me that if there's a problem in the world, why not change it? Mm -hmm. So that's why I see the world as a very dynamic place that I can change and affect. And I love to use the math and science that I've learned to help people. Yes. That's right. What, what amazing parents you have that are teaching you as a young boy that, yeah. that if there's a problem, try to solve it. Yeah. It's fantastic. Okay, so the first invention was, the first one, you were eight. And is this it or no? Uh, this is it. Okay, and what so, is it? Um, so, you know, I love to play golf. And when I was playing on a cold day, I realized that my ball wasn't flying as far as it normally would. So when I came home, I did some research on golf ball construction. I took a few balls open with the help of my dad's giant clippers, and found that colder temperatures create less of bounce as my ball flies off the club. Uh-huh. <laughs> so that's why I designed the golf ball temperature preserver. It preserves my golf ball's temperature on a cold day. Wow, okay, so... Yeah, um... Is there a crock pot under here? What's, what is... <laughs> what do you put them in? My mom does have one of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, well, um... So we have a little test set up. Okay. So we have some balls that have been exposed directly to the ice. Yes. And some golf balls that have been in my preserver also in the ice. Okay. So here's one that's been directly in the ice. I'll get one that's furthest down. Okay. Um, it's very cold. And here's my preserver. Okay. And let's uh, take the top off. I want golf balls here. There you go. So which one do you think feels colder? This one feels colder? Yes. 
Yeah, this one feels normal. Oh, so is it supposed to be warm or a regular? Because is this legal to warm your? <laughs> well, uh, well, no, 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 my invention gets, gets around this and complies with that rule by actually preserving your golf ball's temperature. Because it's definitely legal to maintain your golf ball's temperature by the rules of golf. <laughs> Super smart. All right. Let's go over here. All right. Let's go see a few more of your inventions. I can't believe that was your first one. Well, <laughs> that's crazy. Okay, what's the? Which one are we doing next? I think this, this one. one yeah. Okay. So well, this is my next one in chronological order. But, okay. Um, so when my sisters, my twin, I have twin sisters. They're seven. When they were learning how to ride a bike, they had to make a choice. So either they could leave the training wheels on and be safe, but not get the feel of balancing their own body weight on two wheels. Or they could take the training wheels off and get the feel of balancing, but then it was falling and getting hurt. So that's why I designed retractable training wheels, which you can adjust while you're actually riding. So if you're feeling confident, you hold the handlebar down and the wheels come up. But then if you feel like you're about to fall, you let it go and the wheels come back to the ground so you don't hurt yourself. Unbelievable. Thank you. Really, really smart. Now, are, is this out? Have you patented this? And is this? Well, you know, actually, for all three of my inventions that I'm going to show you, I have filed for a provisional patent. You know, I really enjoy the math and the science and the process of innovation mm -hmm. um, behind them. You know, for this one, I've been approached by a bike manufacturer. For the last one, I've been approached by a golf retailer. Right. So, you want to be a partner? Yeah, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I mean, really, this is, these are all ideas. And this idea, I, I heard a little bit about this. Let's talk about this. This is the most recent, right? Well, this is my invention for the Discovery Education 3M Young Scientist Challenge. So, basically, I survived Hurricane Wilma by hiding in the closet playing Monopoly with my mom. I what, what was the hurricane? Hurricane Wilma. Okay. Uh, by the way, I lose. it's a lot easier to win when your parents are distracted by a Category 3 storm. <laughs> 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 Superstorm Sandy also got me thinking about ways people can prepare and prevent for floods. Mm -hmm. But today, sandbags are the most common method of flood protection. But they can be heavy. They can weigh almost 40 pounds. So you're trying to pick one up. Okay. Oh, yeah. very, very heavy. Okay. okay. <laughs> and, they can be, and they can be difficult to transport. And they leave gaps in between individual bags. So that's why I redesigned the sand or sandbag, replacing the sand with polymer and salt. When dry, my bag is really lightweight, weighing only four pounds. There's a, it's in here right now? Right. Okay. But then when you expose it to water, it expands and offers great protection against salt water flooding. And then after the flood, you just let the water evaporate and the polymer and salt will turn to the dry state so it's reusable. So yeah, he's a pretty amazing kid. And while he was on the show, um, Huffy, the bike manufacturer, called his family. And his dad said it was the best thing ever happened to him. It took him six months to get work with Huffy. They said, we sell about three million bikes with training wheels on them every year. We'd like to put your invention on our, our bikes. And we'll pay you $2 for every bike. And so, but he, on the Ellen show, she found out that he really wanted to meet um, Peyton Manning, the football player. So she arranged for them to play golf together. And Peyton Manning, the football player, told Peyton, the little kid, that every place he played football, he created a fund for teachers to get professional development because the schools didn't have enough money. So before Peyton signed his contract with Huffy, Peyton, the little kid, he started a nonprofit. And he gets $2 per bike. He gives a dollar per bike to this fund so that teachers in Florida can get professional development so that more kids get the opportunity to make inventions like he did. So he's a, he's a really cute kid. So yeah, it, that's worth applause. <laughs> and if you, if you go to the 3M Young Scientist Challenge site, you can see the videos of the kids making their five minute presentations, talking to other people. And I've been the head judge the last five years. 49 of the 50 kids have ended up with patents and are millionaires before they finish high school. I know you have some kids in your schools who have the same kind of ideas. 
Oops, this is another competition. This is seventh, eighth, and ninth grade e-cyber mission. The US Army runs this. You need a group of four kids from the same grade. These were kids from my church. Uh, they're in eighth grade here. They won in seventh grade. They won $100,000 scholarships as seventh graders. But what you do in e-cyber mission is you take pictures of something happening around where you live that's a problem, and then you write a paragraph of how you think you could solve it. And then the Army assigns somebody with a PhD in that area to work with the kids. They call, they Skype, and talk to them at least once a week. And the kids put together a portfolio of how they're going to solve the problem. The top 100 teams come to DC. They meet the president. They meet all these other people. And then uh, I think there's like 10 teams that win $100,000 scholarships. So that's seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. All right. Uh, all of this work, like working with, the high, working with the gifted kids, trying to get everybody to be more engaged, training the teachers. In terms of our scores in our school system, when we started, 40% of our kids were on grade level on fifth and eighth grade science. In three years' time, we went to 84% on grade level. We went at 44 points while our state went up five. In biology, we went at 35 while our state went up 10. The science teachers trusted me and jumped in the deep end. The math teachers were a little bit more skeptical, which is understandable. So math teachers, I said, give me a minute and a half to two minutes of every math lesson. And they said, oh, we can do that. So I brought in master math teachers, paid them to work in the summer. And we put a discovery asset with every math lesson, third grade through 10th grade just to give kids a reason to learn math. In, in uh, third through fifth grade, our scores went up almost 30 points while the state went up seven. Middle school went up 23 while the state went up five, or no, 33. And uh, algebra went up 26 while the state went up six. And when we started in all of our scores, there was a 37 point uh, gap between the poor kids and the rich kids. At the end of three years, it was seven. Because of that, we won the Broad Award, which is considered the Super Bowl of urban education, because rarely does anybody decrease that gap. And it was from using STEM, real world problems, to making kids want to learn and to helping teachers figure out a better way to teach. Whoops, I don't need that. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, just in, in conclusion, we, a lot of people know a lot about STEM and they think STEM has to be spending lots of money on devices and 3D printers. I told you about the, um, the school that my church adopted. And we, when we started with them, about 10% of the kids in that school are on grade level. We've been working with them for nine years. Last year, 90% of the kids were on grade level. So we've made a huge difference. But last year the, before camp, the, the sixth graders were coming to three weeks of camp. And so the teacher came to me and said, Cindy, we really need 3D printers. I'm like, all right, see what kind of deal we can get. And he called me about a week later and he said, I found a place we can get three of them and a kit for $1,500. I'm like, that's great, order them. So they come in and he sends me a text. He's like, they're here, but they're not put together and there's no directions. Are you good at putting stuff together? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. But I'm like, we have 126 graders for three weeks. Put them on the table and let's see what they can do with them. I thought it would take them three weeks because these are poor kids never played with any of this stuff. Anyway, the first day they got two of them up and running. The second day, they called the 800 number five times and asked some questions. The third day, they used the ones they put together to make the pieces they were missing to get the third one to work. <laughs> the fourth day, the teacher sent me a 911 text. I drive to the school. I thought some kid had cut off a finger. I get there, and he's like, call this man from the 3D printer company. He's calling the front office, driving the lady crazy, and she's going to quit. So I call the guy. I'm like, Mr. Smith, what's the problem? He's like, there's no problem. I want to hire Juan, Jose, and Maria. I'll start them at $50 an hour. I'm like, you can't hire them. They're 12. <laughs> And so these kids went from being 12-year-olds who were poor kids that people felt sorry for, two to three years below grade level in reading, math, and science. They realized they had skills that can make them more money than their parents, their teacher, or their principal would ever know. That's the power of STEM. And it can't just be for a select group of kids. In many schools, the robotics club, the STEM classes are for the gifted kids. Or there's a special school that you have, to, you have to be able to get in and the poor kid's parents can't figure it out. The National Science Foundation says, the more diverse the group solving a problem, the more robust the solution. It is our moral obligation to make sure that all of our kids get this opportunity. And you'll see if you start doing this, the poor kids encounter problems every day. The rich kids, if, they're, if their uh, device dies or breaks, their parents buy them a new one. But the poor kids have to problem solve and figure it out. We need their thinking. This tells you my age. Do or do not, there's no try. We have to figure this out. Where are we going to go next? We would love to come sit down with you and meet with you. This is my email address. If you're on Twitter, I'm STEM Boss. Please follow me. Um, I'm going to, I haven't posted this presentation yet. I will tonight so that when you click on my name through the Q program, you'll be able to get to it. But thank you guys very much for coming and uh, keep calm and STEM on. So thank you.